first of all, to kill him, and when that didn't work, to discredit him and disgrace him in front of others by making him compromise uh, and, and seek himself instead of the people of Israel. All of that failed, and now we get to chapter 7 and see that the job of building that wall is finally complete. So Nehemiah chapter 7, verses 1 and 2 Then it was when the wall was built and I had hung the doors when the gatekeepers and singers and the Levites had been appointed that I gave the charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. So the wall is built. Uh, The doors are hung. Jerusalem is finally secure again. And this is a... This is kind of a symbolic gospel. Uh, God, it, it's, it's God completing his promise of restoration to his people after they had been devastated. Uh, and, and this becomes a message to the New Testament people, too, of God restoring his people when it seems as though they're devastated. Uh, so it's a, it's a historical thing that has ramifications far beyond that, and even to Christ himself as the one who does the restoring a couple of notes. Uh, First of all, the duty of keeping the the doors or the gates. Uh, There actually was a group of people called just gatekeepers. That was their sole job, was to watch the gates. Uh, Particularly, I mean, there were several gates. There There was a wall all the way around Jerusalem with gates on it, and then there was a wall around the temple complex with gates around it. And there were gatekeepers at all of these various levels of gates and walls. Uh, But here, Nehemiah seems to appoint others, Uh, the singers, the Levites. Let's see, when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, it almost seems as if he is also assigning the singers and the Levites to help the gatekeepers, like it's all kind of being their job, which it normally wouldn't be. Uh, But considering the dangerousness of the times, the threats of the enemies and all of that, it seems like Nehemiah is appointing extra people to keep watch over this so that they don't get overrun. Another interesting thing is the fact that he gives charge of Jerusalem. It's not surprising he gives it to this Hanani, which is his brother. But next to this Hananiah guy, that is a surprise. Uh, it says this guy is the leader of a citadel. The citadel is the, uh, is the military complex in Jerusalem. So these, these are the heads of the, head of the, the, the military. Um, the military of Israel was actually the military of Persia because Israel was there under Persia's uh, direct intervention. Persia sent Israel there and is funding it. So the leader of the citadel would have been considered loyal to the king of Persia, not just to the Jews. But this guy is particularly unique, it says, in that He fears God more than many. End of verse 2. So he is a man of faith in the true God and faithfulness, it sounds like, uh, despite the fact that he is considered loyal, first of all, to Persia. So he's uh, a uniquely qualified man to be in charge of things. And really, it's, it's brilliant in a way, too. Um, now if the enemies attack Jerusalem and we have this kind of Persian representative in the military, those enemies are going to be attacking Persia when they attack Israel. Uh, and, and the Persian king would respond. So it's, it's a brilliant choice of someone to be in charge of Jerusalem. Verse 3, And I said to them, Do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened, until the sun is hot, and while they stand guard, let them shut the doors and bar them, and appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, one at his watch station and another in front of his own house. Uh, yeah, the don't open the gates until the sun is hot. Everything is uh, done in the daylight. No, no chances of anybody sneaking in at dark or twilight. Uh, just all security security ideas here to make sure Jerusalem is kept safe. 
and the appointing guards, you know, the watch is one thing, but this business of appointed another one to stand in front of his house. Uh, the the house were, houses were often, you know, around the city walls and such. Maybe that's sort of a, an extra layer of security. They're watching outward and they're watching inward for anything suspicious. Verses four to six. Now the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few. And the houses were not rebuilt. Then my God put it into my heart to gather the nobles, the rulers, and the people that they might be registered by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return and found written in it. And then there's this long, long list of people. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we see here Nehemiah, the record keeper. You know, these guys, Ezra too was a scholar. Nehemiah is a scholar and a record keeper. They kept meticulous records uh, for a couple of reasons. Again, one, because being part of the, the people of Israel, you had to be able to trace your genealogy. That's what marked you as a child of God. And secondly, it's your genealogy that would ultimately establish the Messiah and who he was because the Jews were told out of what tribe he came. So families had to keep very detailed genealogies uh, because for religious purposes, that's what made them sure they were part of the people of God and would make them sure of the Messiah when he came. You know, ironically though, they seem to ignore the genealogy when the Messiah actually does come. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that's what these lists will establish now, whether or not the people there are actually Jews and actually have the genealogical credentials to be considered the children of God. So, yeah, six. These are the people of the province who came back from the captivity of those who had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away captive and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his own city. Uh, so Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, that was about 70 years prior to this. Um, and then, then we get the list. And there's really nothing in this list that jumps out or nothing surprising. Uh, when you add it all up, you wind up with, is it 42,000? I think it's, if you skip ahead to uh, verse 73. Senate gatekeepers, nope, nope. Six, verse 66. Yeah, there we go, thank you. So altogether, the whole congregation was 42,360. So 42,000 people. Uh, that's not a lot. The, the population, I've got kind of notes on under verse 73 on the handout. The population of Jerusalem itself in the first century was about 660,000. And the current population of Jerusalem in our day is about 880,000. So there's room in Jerusalem for a big population. 42,000 is nothing. And that's not just Jerusalem either. That's Jerusalem and the surrounding area that that 42,000 fills. So Jerusalem was practically a ghost town, even with like 20,000 people in it. Uh, it wasn't much. And for a, a small group like that to defend this large city with the city walls, that was a major task. I did find it kind of interesting in this list, verse 61 to 65, how there was a group, again, how meticulous their record keeping is and how they didn't just take everybody's word for things. There was a group of people who didn't make the cut. Uh, 61, and these are the ones who came up from Tel Mahal, uh, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adon, Immer, but they could not identify their father's house nor their lineage, whether they were of Israel. The children of Delilah, the children of Tobiah, the children of Nicoda, 642, etc., uh, etc., et verse 64. These sought their listing among those who were registered by genealogy, but it was not found. Therefore, they were excluded from the priesthood as defiled. The governor said to them that they should not eat the most holy things until a priest could consult with the Urim and Thummim. That Urim and Thummim thing, nobody's exactly sure what that is. It could be something like 
a dice or a die with basically two sides, you know, a, a, a yes and a no, and the priest would roll it uh, or flip it or something, uh, I'd flip a coin basically, one side's yes, one side's no. And that would be how they would determine the will of God in certain things. In fact, in the Old Testament priest at Urim and Thummim was a part of the priestly, the, 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 the high priest's garment that he would keep in his garment. And if there was a question that God had not revealed in his word that they wanted to know God's will, they'd basically take a coin out and flip it. Um, no, it was actually part of God's command to them that that be part of the priest, high priest garment. And it was only through the high priest. It wasn't, the common people couldn't flip coins to figure out what God's will was. Matthias? Yeah, replace Judas with Matthias. Right, it's really no different than that. That um, it, is, it is kind of casting of lot. It's this one or that one. And, it, and it's the same sort of thing. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's not, you know, completely devoid of human common sense. It's not really pure chance. The, the belief is still that God is guiding the yes or the no. But, like, like, take the example of the election of Matthias when Judas's office was empty. They narrowed it down to two men. You know, they used their common sense and their... Uh, their minds to figure out who was the most fitting for the position. They got down to two men, couldn't decide between the two, and then they cast lots. Uh, I do know of a, uh, occasionally call lists, even now, if a congregation gets down to two guys on the call list and they can't decide which one and the vote for is kind of deadlocked, I've heard of them flipping a coin. Um, so it's not, it's like basically saying whatever the decision is, we trust that God's going to work with it. Here, it's a little more than that. When the high priest of the Jews did this, it was considered that this, this is actually God intervening and giving a yes or a no. I have a, on the handout a little explanation of what the terms mean. So where it says, verses 61 to 65, uh, Urim and Thummim, many scholars believe that Urim simply derives from the Hebrew term Arim, meaning curses, and thus, the Urim and Thummim essentially means cursed or faultless, you know, guilty or innocence, in reference to God's judgment of an accused person. In other words, Urim and Thummim were used to answer the question of guilty or, or innocent or guilty. So when it comes to deciding whether these people actually are Jews or not, here, uh, the question is, you know, Jew or not, flip the coin and God will reveal his will there. I guess if they were found to be Jews, then they were considered uh, open to everything but evidently the priesthood. They weren't allowed to enter the priesthood because that, that was more than just being a Jew. That was you had to prove Levitical, of Levitical connection. So if they couldn't even prove they were part of Israel, how would they prove that they were actually of Levi? So, Any other thoughts? Yeah. Right. I, a couple of things. One, Israel had a different God than the rest of the people. And Israel's God seemed to actually be keeping promises and, and fulfilling his will. And, you know, their gods were blocks of stone and wood and weren't, obviously, uh, weren't keeping their will or anything. So... The fact that, that Israel's gods seemed to be powerful was a threat to them and their false gods. I think that was part of it. And I think the other part of it is that they see the Israelites coming back in waves and they know there's probably more coming. And the more Jews that come into it, uh, the more of their own power they're going to lose. So they're, I think they're worried about their own power and influence too. All right. Um, okay, verse 66 to 69, we see even the animals get counted in all this. Uh, 66, uh, 
42,360 people, 767 besides their male and female servants, who were 7,337. You know, very detailed records versus 68. Horses, 736. Mules, 245. Uh, they had a lot of donkeys, 6,720 donkeys. So even the animals get counted in this census that they took. Um, yeah, they note who gives what gifts in verse like 72. Um, all meant to be a, a verification that God has fulfilled his promises. This, it wasn't just vague promises that God kind of fulfilled somehow. The details prove God is faithful down to the smallest detail. Verse 73, uh, so the priests, Levites, gatekeepers, singers, some of the people, the Nethanim, all Israel, dwelt in their cities. When the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. So we see that that number is all the cities around Jerusalem, not just Jerusalem itself. All right, a little bit of chapter 8. So 7 is kind of, you know, nothing really noteworthy in seven, other than the shift of power from Nehemiah to these others. Eight, we see a return of Ezra. So we'll read a little bit of chapter eight, verse one. Now as the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. Now, now note this is a grassroots thing. The people gather, the people ask for the book to be brought out and read to them. It's not a top down, the priest telling people, you got to learn this stuff. They want to learn it. So there's a hunger for God's word. Uh, God fulfilling his promises creates this hunger. They want, they want to know more about God. They want to be closer to him. Verse 2 to 3, So Ezra the priest brought out the law before the congregation of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and the women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. He read it from morning until midday. Our service goes an hour and 15 minutes and people start looking at their watches. Can you imagine? Can you imagine all day long just standing there reading God's word too? Um, and, they were, and they were attentive. The text specifically says that they, they, they kept their attention, attention. So they listened well. Now on the handout, you know, consider, you know, consider the seriousness with which they treat the Word of God. In our day, a congregation's attentiveness to listen is roughly 10 to 12 minute range. Yeah, that used to be, you know, a couple generations ago, pastors preached for half an hour. And then, I think when I first started, the standard was about 20 minutes. And now it's 10 to 12 is the standard for a sermon. What's happened? If you look back at the Civil War and some of the speeches that were given in the Civil War, they lasted hours. You know, at the Gettysburg Address, before Lincoln gave that, there was somebody else who spoke, who's not remembered, who is speech was two hours long. Lincoln's was two minutes. <laughs> and when Lincoln sat back down, he said, I forget the exact comment he made, but it was to the effect of that speech isn't going to wash. You know, it wasn't, wasn't good enough. But everybody remembers his two-minute one, not the two-hour long one. What has happened? Um, there, there is a significant shift in how people how people hear information. Um, I, I, I've, got, I've got a couple of books, actually. There's, there's a good one, All God's Children in Blue Suede Shoes is the name of the book. And it, and it does talk a little bit about the shifting of the, of the American mind and what's happened. That, the, the TV culture and the entertainment culture has created a visually dependent way of gathering information. Um, we want to see it, and we want it in clips. 
You know, you watch, you watch any show, it's seen to, it, it, the clips move from clip to clip to clip to clip. It's not, not more than just a couple of seconds of one point of view at a time and then the camera angle shifts. We've trained our minds to gather information by these fast little clips and sound bites to the point where we have actually lost the ability to really concentrate for an extended period of time and focus with our ears. Uh, that it, that it, it's something that has been created by technology that's hurt our minds, but a lot of people seem to think is progress. <laughs> so yeah, the, the, the way we gather information as human beings, as Americans particularly, has changed. Yeah. They didn't read. Yeah, they listened. They listened, right. Yeah, and they weren't dumb. Some of those old speeches, Civil War era, you read the kind of English that they used. It's very ornate, very detailed English. It's, it's not colloquial. They didn't talk down to people. They expected people to hear up to their level. It's a, an amazing thing. All right, anyway, it's a bit of a digression, but uh, when, when Ezra preached, it was all day long that he read God's word. Uh, verses 4 to 6, chapter 8. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him at his right hand stood <sighs> Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Urijah, Hilkiah, and Mas Masiah, and at his left hand, Padiah, there's a lot of ayahs in there, uh, Michelle, Melkajaya, Melkaja, Hashem, Hashabadana, <laughs> Zechariah, and Meshalem. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. What does that remind you of in the divine service? Standing at a platform, opening up the book, reading it, and all the people standing up. It's the gospel lesson. That's right. Our, our, actually, our worship service is modeled after ancient Jewish worship. Always has been. Uh, the divine service wasn't just made up by Europeans. It's been modeled after ancient Jewish practice. And this is one of them. The reading of the gospel, you stand up. It's up on a platform because, you know, why? What's the purpose of standing up? What's, what's that a sign of? Why stand up? Respect. Right, reverence. Yeah, yeah, it's a sign of respect and reverence. So it's uh, posture says something. Uh, seven to eight. Oh, actually, uh, six. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Again, at the end of the reading of the gospel, we sing Amen, just like they did. And it says then they, they worship, bowed their heads and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground when they, it's, it's the posture of prayer. Again, does posture matter? I think it says something. You know, it's, it's not a law that you have to do it this way, but your, your body posture says something about reverence and devotion. And again, the nature of a service itself says something of this. Um, one of the reasons why, why I have resisted all the, the kind of contemporary movement with the service is there's a, a notable difference in the spirit of the thing. With the historic worship of the church, there is a very clear reverence, a devotion, a bowing of the head, a, and a standing at these places. You're, the, it's, a, it's a different spirit than one finds in contemporary type worship settings where the spirit is supposed to be very joyful and uplifting and all of that. Well, there's a place for that, but that in ancient worship, that wasn't the main focus. The main focus was reverence, repentance, reception of forgiveness, not just being happy to the point sometimes even of being silly. So posture says something. Verses 7 and 8. Also, Jeshua, Bani, etc., etc., 
uh, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book of the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. What is, what's that in our service? The sermon, exactly. You hear the reading, and then you hear an explanation of it to help you understand the reading. That's what a sermon is supposed to be. So again, our structure is modeled after ancient Jewish worship. This is how they did it. Of course, there seemed to have lasted from morning until midday. Uh, but, and it also, you know, they took turns. It's not like all these people were saying something at the same time. They were, they were all taking turns explaining the text and preaching. So you didn't just get one sermon that day. You got like a dozen by the sound of it. That was a grueling day of worship. Uh, verse 9 Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep, for, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Why would they be weeping when they hear the law? And the law, by the way, is the first five books of the, of the Old Testament. It's not just the Ten Commandments. Why would they weep when they heard the law? It's repentance, right, because they were so far from the law. They recognized, they recognized the sins of their people and how they led them into this captivity and now how God was restoring them. It's probably a combination of sorrow for, for their sins in the past and a certain, you know, tears of, of joy in some sense that God had restored them. But this, the sorrow seems to be predominating. Um, they, they approach worship repentant to the point of tears, now, this, this wasn't what they wanted worship to be. So we see in the next verse, they try and stop that. Then they said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweets, for those who, for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Yes, there's a place for repentance and sorrow over sin, but don't dwell there. You know, you can't earn something from God by being really, really sorry. You're sorry for your sins, repent, leave your sins there, and then enjoy the joy of forgiveness. You know, eat a nice meal. There's your Sunday afternoon, your Sunday dinner. Have a nice meal. Eat well. Uh, be joyful. God isn't holding your sins over you. So again, it's, it's a marvelous statement about what worship should be. There is a place for repentance. And in fact, we start our service, every single service, first thing we do, confession of sins. We start with the sorrow for sin and then it builds throughout the service to joy at the end. You know, hopefully the last thing you hear in the sermon is something about grace and forgiveness and, you know, go your way rejoicing. Uh, by the end of the service, you receive the Lord's Supper and can go away happy, but you begin in repentance, you end in joy and forgiveness, just like they were teaching these people. And verses 11 to 12, So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy, do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions, and to rejoice greatly, because they understood the words that were declared to them. It's a marvelous example of the restoration of right worship in Israel. God kept his promises to them in restoring them and even to the point now of restoring their faith. It wasn't just walls he restored, it was their spirit, their soul, their faith. All right, any comments or questions? Then let's close. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the gifts that you give us, for the grace shown us this day and especially. Be with us, build us up in your word and by your sacrament, and strengthen us for these evil days in which we live, for Jesus' sake.